I do appreciate everybody coming out today. Been a lot of people registered for the giveaways. Uh, we're giving away a Rikon lathe, a 7100 uh, 12 by 16 Rikon lathe. Giving away uh, Easy With Tools uh, miniature micro Halloween set just came out. Giving away a Chromacraft set of starter kit, epoxy resin, resin tints, pearlescent powders, uh, and spin gems. Make a nice resin starting kit. Also giving away a Carter & Son uh, 5 8 bowl gouge, a trend complete sharpening kit, and Yorkshire grit and some hamster sheen today. That's what we're giving away. Um, I'd like to introduce everybody who's here with me today. Uh, you see Mr. Zach Higgins there from NV Woodworks. I did say Morning. NV Woodworks. Then we have uh, Mr. Michael Roper from Roper Wood Turning out there in Colorado. Good afternoon, Mr. Everyone. Roper looking good. Uh, Mr. Chris Caliendo, owner of Easy Wood Tools, is joining us this morning. Chris, appreciate you coming by. Absolutely. Good afternoon, everyone. The bottom left screen, if y'all are seeing a split screen, is out in my studio where I'll be after a while turning. And then we have Dan West from Westwood Working. Is that correct, Dan? Yeah, West Works Woodworking. West Works West Works Woodworking. Yeah, say that three times fast. Yeah, I can. <laughs> I can't do that at all. Um, so again, I can't see the screen yet, so I'm hopefully there's a few folks hanging around with us. We have chosen and Zach drew the short straw for one of the three demonstrations today. Woo Zach is going to be casting some resin. So Zach, why don't you go ahead and tell us uh, what you're going to be doing and get rolling with her. All right, well, today we are going to be doing a little bit of resin casting. I got some gator jawbone that's been kind of sitting around. I've been, I did some stuff with it earlier, but I thought, let's pull that back out and toss it in some resin, make some pen blanks out of it. Uh, and I also have some short cutoffs uh, of the, the jaw that I thought we'd just toss in and, and make a, a stopper. So just a little bit of fun doing some dunk and junk, I thought. I think, I think it'll be kind of cool. So uh, let me get my camera positioned correctly for the casting, and I'll kind of go through, show you what's going on, kind of do this. Uh, if, if people haven't done any resin casting before, but you're thinking about getting into it, uh, pretty fun, pretty, uh, pretty simple. Not too much to it, but uh, I'll kind of walk you through some of the stuff that I do to make sure I get good results. So, uh, first thing for pen blanks, uh, I have these P-Town Subby, uh, the, that's the brand, uh, silicone molds that we're going to make. Uh, they're 7 eighths square by about 5 and a quarter. Here's our gator jawbone. I don't have a screen. <laughs> I'm used to looking at one screen here for my live stream, so i got to look up and make sure I'm on the camera here. Uh, but pretty cool stuff. These are actual alligator jaw bones. Uh, and this one I, I die stabilized. It, it was actually supposed to be red, but it, it kind of turned out a little bit pink. But that's cool. Uh, so we got a couple of those. I think I got four, four pieces. So we'll do kind of two sets of that. Make a couple different pen blanks. And I got these little cutoffs because I, I, I cut these things down so that they'd fit in our mold. So I got these little cutoffs and I thought we'd just toss them in a PVC pipe, make a kind of a stopper or a like a shift knob, uh, I don't know, a, a really small lidded box <laughs> type blank. Uh, so it's kind of fun. So I'm going to be using a Lumalite resin today. Uh, it doesn't really matter which resin you use, but a lot of the things that I do uh, today and some of the, the tips and tricks and things that I, I share are going to be a little bit specific to the resin I'm using. Uh, but <clears throat> Really, it doesn't matter. You pick a resin and, and toss some stuff in there. Um, one thing that I want to show you guys, let's see if we can kind of put that up there. So what I've done here is I'm heating up the molds and I'm also even heating up the, the jawbone uh, in my oven here. And I got it set at around 135 or so uh, Fahrenheit for anybody that's not in the U.S. So 135 Fahrenheit. Um, you want to get those things warmed up so that you don't have, uh, you know, creep in the corners. Uh, the, the resin is going to want to kind of suck to the middle. That's going to be the hottest spot. So you always want to warm it up so it'll kind of flow out. And on the, the gator jaw itself, uh, or, or whatever you're going to be putting in resin, you want that to have no moisture in it. So that's why I'm doing that. Uh, you want to flash off any surface moisture. Uh, if 
you're doing wood or something like that, that that can really hold a lot of moisture, uh, really you need to dry that out fully beforehand. So in some cases, depending on the size of the wood, how much moisture, um, you know, you might have to actually dry that in an oven for, you know, hours to, to days in some cases. So uh, those things, half of them are stabilized, the other ones are dry. So we just want to flash off the surface. So this is hard to read because my, my jug, oh, there I can see the, the screen now. Alumalite Clear. Uh, this is a polyurethane resin. That's what I'm going to be using. Uh, I've been using it for my blanks forever, so it's just the one that I kind of kind of like, you know. Uh, now I don't know. Let's see. Can I see? Is there chatting going on or anything? No, oh, there is. There is. There is some going on. Little bit of chatting. <laughs> How's it going, Megan? I'm a magician. <laughs> I don't know about that. I just like to have fun with resin, you know. So one thing that I always do, and uh, since we're kind of doing a demo and I don't really know the audience necessarily, I usually mention this anyway on my, my own live streams on Fridays, but I think one of the biggest, most important tools that you can have as a resin caster, or frankly, whatever, you know, it doesn't really matter what you're doing, taking notes is extremely important. So for every casting that I make, I'm going to write down notes. So a couple of the things that I'm going to write in here are what type of mold? So on the, the first one, we're going to do some of them pen blanks. So the mold is a, a, I just call it, you know, I have like little names for things. It's a two blank P town. I'm going to write down what type of resin I'm using. So I'm using Alumalite Clear, and this is the slow set version. It's going to give me 12 minutes of working time. Then I'm going to write down notes, and, and this kind of helps when you're actually casting. You're going to write down how much do you need. So those those molds hold about, I want to say it's like 80 grams. Let me pull one of those out so I can kind of show you, especially for people that are just kind of joining the fun. This is what I'm going to be casting it in, and each one of these, I, I believe they're about 75, 80 grams. I always like to overshoot, so I'm definitely going to go with the 80 grams per, per line. Uh, so that's 160 grams total. Now this product that I'm using is going to be a one-to-one -one ratio, so that's 80 times two. <clears throat> now you need to write down, you know, what are we going to do with these things? So, uh, you know, colorants, uh, are you going to go with clear? Are you going to go with mica powders? I think on this first one, uh, one of the one of the cool ones to do with Gator Jaw is to make Florida Gators blanks, so orange and and blue. So we're gonna go with the white ones. We're gonna make some orange and blue. So I'm just gonna be using some mica powders. Pull these guys out here. <clears throat> Let me find my favorite ones here. So Zach, did you see the post that I had out yesterday with the uh, car being painted with the multicolors uh, pearl paints? No. Um, it's on my personal page. I think my mother sent it to me. They took, it's for automotive finish, and they took a blue and a gold pearl paint, uh -huh. poured them together into the spray gun, and then painted the car. And so once it's dry and it's out in the sun, it's, uh, it's a color shift that, as you walk around it. Oh, wow. And it's just completely mixed. And I was, Bridget's going, hey, that, can you put that on wood, Bradley? And I said, absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Well, you know, the funny thing is a lot of people actually, you know, I'm using mica powders here. This is a, a brand, the, the Caster's Choice brand. But a lot of people actually use automotive paint. They come, they look, they're like the same exact things. And you just add it to your clear coat. And so they got, they, the automotive paint industry actually has quite a few different cool effects like that. Uh, they, they, they have, they actually have, and I actually sell this, um, a blue to purple. This, I, I sell this specific one. I find that this combination works really well for, uh, for, for resin casting, but you get this color shift effect. Let's see if we can get some light on that. I don't really have very good light here, fortunately, but that's not really showing up. But uh, it, it makes a really cool effect. Actually, I have this one. This is my 25,000 subscriber project. Let's see if that'll show up a little bit. Dang it. Come on, light. Oh, we lost our light. Uh -oh. <clears throat> Sorry, guys. You can't see my color. You know, you just can't trust these, these lights anymore. Anyway, so let's get back to it here. So 80 grams times two. Uh, what I'm going to do here, I picked out my blaze orange. 
and my cobalt blue, or yeah, cobalt blue. It's not really focusing very well, but uh, it's my uh, Gaster's Choice mica powders. Uh, I'm going to go with a little bit heavier amount of the blue, so let's go with 70% with the blue in it, 30% with the the orange. Do a little bit of non-mental math because it's too early in the morning for that. Uh, 160 times 0.7 is about 112. Now, Zach, if you figured out over trial and error and practice what levels um, or amounts to put in that, have, that work well for you? Well, it kind of depends. Um, one thing for, for pen blanks, and I actually just put up a video about this. For pen blanks, and I'll kind of show you guys. I'm going to try and get another light in here that's actually going to work. Oh, there we go. You just had to think about it for a minute. Um, when, when you're mixing it in the cup, a lot of people, you know, you add your mica powders and let's say you had, you know, this much resin in the cup. The problem is that's a thick amount of resin and powder. And so the lights, you know, it, these things are going to diffract the light when it's in the, the resin. And it's going to look a lot darker and pearlier and, and more effects. The problem is for pen blanks that you turn, you know, you drill out the center and then turn it down to like a sliver of resin, basically. So there's just not that much mica powder per square inch or whatever. Um, so the best way is when you're mixing, pull out a little bit on your stir stick. And if you can see the wood grain, that stuff's going to be see-through uh, by the time you're done turning it into a pen blank. Now, if you're making something like a bottle stopper or, or bigger, then whatever's in the cup is going to be, you know, that's going to give you a good idea of how the blank's actually going to look because there's, it's the same mass, you know. So that's kind of how I did it. Now, some of them, you know, like lime green, a lot of times, there's almost not enough that you can put in the, you know, in the blank uh, to make it completely see-through. And what we're, you know, for people that aren't pen turners, one of the problems why you don't want it to be see-through is you're going to see that brass tube in there and you don't want that a lot. Of, you know, you want it, most of us cover those up. Uh, so there are some of them that, that don't work as well as others, but you know, uh, generally once you kind of, you know, like I said, once you can pull it out of the, the, the cup and you can't see wood grain, you got a really good pearl effect going on at that point. So for this one, so let's see here, cobalt, and I've, you know, I've used these, this brand before. Um, we're going to go for kind of a heavy dose of this stuff. So we really want it to be kind of as opaque as possible. So for this one that has 112 grams, that's going to be our blue. We're going to put, uh, and, and like I said, I want to make sure we're going to put three quarter teaspoon in, in 112 grams. That's pretty much your guaranteed. That's, that's going to be opaque. And then for the orange, 48 grams total, I'm going to put half teaspoon. And again, that's going to be a very good uh, opaque mixture with these two colors. Uh, one of the things that I'll say is a lot of this stuff does kind of tend to, you know, you, you'll learn more with experience. You know, you'll, you'll know. And the importance of having that notebook is let's say that, you know, I went with like one eighth teaspoon this time and said, Oh, I think that's going to be enough. If it turns out that it wasn't, then go back to your notebook and write down a note and say, you better put more in next time, buddy. You know, so that way you improve constantly rather than trying to keep it in memory. Cause I've found for my own self that never worked. <laughs> I'm like, what did I do last time? I don't know. That was an hour ago. What have you found, Bradley? You've been, you've been doing a lot of casting stuff, too. Yeah, you know, I, I'm still way up on the learning curve. Yeah. Uh, and that's, what, that's why I ask. Cause you, got, you got your bearing. It's always kind of a mystery to me. Well, how much do I want to put in? So I've just been going from a visual. Yeah. Uh, one of the reasons being the Chromacraft product is a by volume, not by weight. Yeah. And so I don't weigh anything. I just, you know, mix, <laughs> mix the volumes. So I, though I have a scale, I don't have it employed yet. It's yeah. in a box. Well, so, you know, know, other than the same principle, you know, the, it'd, be, it'd be the same thing. I'm just talking about, you know, 100 grams of resin would be, you know, equivalent to, in your case, like, you know, a, a, you know five ounces or I, I don't know what it really is, but right. you know what I mean? Like, so you could, you can do it by volume. And then the teaspoons that what I'm, what I'm using is just, it's a volume thing. So I, and I like using these. I don't like doing the, oh, it's a popsicle stick worth. That is not a, that's not, <laughs> it's yeah. not repeatable. You know, if you, if you, every time you're doing the same things, you can repeat results for sure. And so I always, you know, even with dyes, I weigh out dyes a lot of times, unless I'm just having fun. 
um, I'm going to put very specific amounts of dye in so that you can recreate yeah. that color specifically. All right, so what I've done over here, let's let's make sure we got our camera set and not bouncing too much. Uh, so I got my, my cup on my scale. I'm zeroing it out. And then going back to my notes, again, this is why it's kind of good to start with notes before you start mixing stuff. So again, I want 160 grams total. Uh, and again, this product's going to be one-to-one -one by weight. So I'm going to put 80 grams of part A, 80 grams of part B. I'm zeroed. Get this a little bit over sort of here. <clears throat> 77. And you, you, you don't make any pen blanks or anything, Bradley. You're doing bigger stuff, right? Yeah. Um, if Always. I tell the truth, I've never turned a pen in my life. Oh, man. Well, the one thing that I will say, you know, there's a lot of people. And I'm okay with that. I'm sure Roper, Rob, I don't know. Does Ro do you turn pens, Roper, at all? Yes, I do. Oh, okay. Well, them, but actually. at the same time, you do mostly like bigger stuff, right? And and I will say the one disadvantage that pen turners have is you have to, you know, you got to buy drill bits and bushings and all. There's all this extra stuff that you have to have. Now, if you're turning wood bowls, you take a piece of wood and throw it on the lathe and start turning. Like there's not that, you know, oh, is it the 27 30 second drill bit or, you know, <laughs> so I will say that is the one disadvantage, I think for pen turning there's a little bit of fuss involved with it right? as compared to just slapping something on there and doing you know turning a spindle or something uh now i'm going to zero this out and we want to put 80 grams of b <clears throat> 70 there we go 80 grams okay so we got everything in the i'm just doing a little bit of pre-check here we got everything in the oven we got our our cup here i'm going to need another cup for when i i'm going to i'm going to mix it all up in this one cup the whole amount and then i'm going to measure off the 30 percent for our orange in this cup and add that here so i'm just going to zero that out for now uh, but we're going to mix it up and when you're mixing resin um, i find it to be really useful using clear cups so that you can see what's going on in there, but you wanna mix it really well. Uh, most people's problems, uh, when, when people run into problems, there's three things that happen. Either they're using a resin that is measured by volume rather than weight or the, the opposite and they do it wrong. So um, Alumalite has lots of products and a lot of people go down to Michael's and they buy the one that's called Amazing Clearcast, which is mixed and like measured by volume, not weight. But then everybody's seeing people that are using Alumalite Clear <laughs> on, on YouTube and whatever, uh, which we, we always do it by weight. And so they get confused. And if you mess up that ratio, it's not going to work. It's not going to cure properly. So number one, make sure you know how, you know how to measure your resin. Is it by volume or weight? Number two, uh, and, and this kind of goes with that same thing, they've, they've not measured it correctly. It's not the, the correct measurement. And that can throw off your, your curing if it's not you know, measured properly. So I use a, a scale here that's good to the 10th gram, which is pretty, that's highly accurate. Um, I think you, in most cases, unless you're doing super tiny amounts of resin, uh, total volume, uh, you know, just the nearest gram is gonna be good enough. But if you wanna you know, measure your dye amounts, that's why I need a 10th gram. Um, so make sure you're measuring it good. And then the, the last thing is they don't mix it properly. They don't get all of the part A's and part B's mixed up and it doesn't cure properly or there's areas that are kind of gooey in there. And that's because everything else cured around a blob of part A or part B. And that's why it's kind of wet in there. So make sure you mix properly. Um, generally you can look in your cup and at least with the Lumalite clear, uh, you know, once there's no hazy swirls mixing around, you're going to see some little air bubbles. It looks like champagne or something. But uh, once the once your little streaky things, the haziness goes away, generally Lumalite Clear is good. Now, for most epoxies that are the your slow setting resins, like you got 30, 45 minutes more, um, I would recommend just keep mixing that thing for like three minutes. Uh, epoxies tend to need a little bit more mixing, even though it looks like it's fully mixed. Um, just keep going. You, you can't overmix resin, but you can sure undermix it. So 
with this one, I got 12 minutes and I already know that it's generally once it's cleared up, we're good to go. Now I'm going to set a timer. I got 12 minutes of working time with this stuff. So I don't want to go over that or else it's going to harden up in the cup. We like to call them lollipops. We don't want lollipops where your, your stir stick is stuck into the cup and you got a blob at the end. Uh, so we need, let's see here, going back to my notes, 48 grams. I'm just going to go with 50. We're going to round up. It's early in the morning and I feel like being wild. It's not that early. Earlier than normal though. All right, so we got our 50 grams. Now, we're gonna get our mica powders out. Let's get, let's get zoomed in here so you guys can see what's kind of happening here. Our cup right there. So this is our, our larger quantity. That's the smaller. Start with our smaller quantity. We're gonna use half a teaspoon of orange. So here's what the mica powder looks like. It's just a, a powdery, if you've never seen these before, it's just a little powder. Uh, people use it for like soap casting and I don't know, other arts and crafts. What else do people use mica powders for? Uh, makeup? Yeah, it's in makeup big time. Um, uh, this is a quarter teaspoon. So I'm gonna do two scoops, just like Raisin Bran. <clears throat> The, uh, the, the powder that's in makeup is FDA approved though. Yeah, I wouldn't recommend eating this stuff. <laughs> but you can sure eat that lipstick if you're you know, in a pinch. <laughs> I've never been that hungry. That's, that's, that's prepping. That's being a prepper right there. All right, so we got that nice and mixed in. I'm gonna clean off my spoon here. I want to mix orange into my blue, <clears throat> then we're going to get brown. And I don't know any Gator fans that would appreciate that. So Zach, what kind of mat is that you have there that you make a mess on? This is a silicone baking mat. They're, they're pretty great because the stuff just pops right off of it. And then under that, I got <clears throat> an HDPE, high density polyethylene, uh, plastic countertop. Um, I've been using it so long and haven't, you know, cleaned it off <laughs> that it's going to be a little harder to get stuff off but generally uh that's what i use for my a lot of my molds is hdpe it's kind of a non-stick material eventually it'll kind of degrade and it'll stick a little bit more but uh, it works great you know if you got like especially if you got something like you know wood or, or something where the resin's really going to stick to it underneath um, these little silicone mats are like 12 bucks it'll save you because inevitably i don't care how careful you are you're going to get resin all over the place you, you know, and it'll stick to wood or anything porous like that and they ain't coming up. All right, so we're mixing our blue. Get my hand out of the way here. So it's looking pretty good. We got some Gators colors. Not bad. There's probably some people. Who's, who's a big rival of the Gators? I don't really know the SEC. Are they SEC? Blue. I can talk NASCAR. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe Alabama or, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> so hopefully we don't have any of those kind of fans. I was so disappointed. There's a uh, dirt track 20 minutes from me. I'd never been and I was going to go last night and they closed. Oh, no. So I missed my opportunity to watch guys in South Georgia on an eighth mile dirt track. Oh, well. That's cool. All right. So I got – three minutes about four, almost four minutes on my clock that seems like it's backwards but uh it's about four minutes um one thing with uh if you're gonna you know mix colors together right now it's really thin you know you can see it just coming off of there it looks kind of watery um this is not a good time to pour a bunch of colors together they're just gonna the colors are gonna bleed so what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna be waiting uh you want to wait till near the end of the working time a lot of guys use um uh, temperature as well. Um, time can be, you know, with different temperature fluctuations in your shop, um, time isn't necessarily the most accurate way. It's not going to be consistent. Uh, so I got this little, uh, this little heat gun, got this at Harbor Freight and it just, it's an infrared thermometer. Um, different resins are going to have different kind of, uh, sweet spots. Um, I generally find with Alumilite clear that, somewhere around 100 degrees. So, you know, and you want to kind of mix it up in the, in the, the cup here and then take your temperature. So we're at like 93 right now. 
I'm going to wait until it gets to around 100 before I actually pour these things to make sure that these colors stay nice and swirly and separate. We want, you know, blue and orange, not brown. <clears throat> That's kind of one of the tricks. And sometimes if you wait too long, that can actually go against you as well. One color may settle to the bottom or something. So you kind of want to find that sweet spot. And sometimes it may take, you know, a little bit of experimentation. Uh, but, you know, give it a few times and try a couple different times with things uh, or temperatures. And you should find a good, good time where, you know, you can, you can get those colors poured and they'll stay separated for you. So I'm going to say we're going to need to wait probably about eight minutes. Um, I, I've been doing time for so long that I kind of know temperatures in the shop and how that's going to affect my timing. Um, but I also, I've been starting to use this heat gun thing because, and, and I kind of recommend, you know, beginners probably just go with this because time can be, and it depends on when you actually start the clock after you've mixed it up. Um, with, with the heat gun, I mean, it's, it's telling you what's going on and it's going to be consistent regardless of other things that are going on, like temperature or humidity or anything like that in your shop. And that, that rise is pretty consistent or is it? As it gets hotter, does it get hotter faster? Uh, honestly, it's going to depend on the resin you're using. Um, usually, you're faster setting resin. So I got I got a resin that sets up in two minutes. You have two minutes to get it every, everything mixed and ready to go and, and pour it uh, and, before it hardens on you. Um, that one kicks. It's going to get hot and it's just going to turn hard. So you really don't have time to mess with that with that one. Now this 12 minute working time. It's got a longer, I'm gonna call it a gel period where it's thickening up and you can look, see it coming off. It's not, it's not just coming off like it was water before. So that's kind of your gel period. And I think we're probably coming up on when we can pour this, but um, Alumilite even has a, a, a regular set. So Alumilite Clear regular set and that time is gonna be shorter, that gel period in that product. Um, your epoxies and things that are like 45 minute working times, those are going to have an even longer gel period. So it, it just kind of depends. You know, I can't say specifically for, for any, any, any specific resin how, what's going to happen. But, yeah, they generally do change on you a little bit. We got our two pieces of gator jaw that are, are – one. I think one of them, because this one's heavy, this one's stabilized, this one's not. And you, you could go either way with gator jaw, with stabilizing. I'm going to just double-check my temp. 99.5 right there. 99. So I'm going to wait one second in my clock. Look how good I am, guys. 740. <laughs> I said eight minutes, right? I know what I'm doing. Actually, I don't really know what I'm doing because it's been hotter in the shop and I just, I just really guessed on that one. <laughs> but so first thing I'm going to do, if I'm going to be embedding things, especially things that have little pockets in them, um, I don't want to stick this in here and then pour resin over it. You're going to get air pockets in there. So I'm going to pour my resin in the mold first, and then I'm going to push my thing down in. So we're ready to go. Um, and I think I'm just going to go for like a double pour. I'm going to pour at the same time. There's all kinds of different techniques for pouring, especially like color swirl stuff here. Actually, let's try this one out. Uh, you know, I could show you just pouring stuff, but let's do something kind of fun. This is called a dirty pour. You pour one cup into the other. And then you don't have to mess around with trying to get swirls or anything. It's just going to come out of the cup with both colors. Uh, and I'm going to actually give it just a little, I'm going to give it a little swizzle. You got to get a, you got to have a little swizzle. And then I'm going to pour it out. It's looking pretty blue there. Now that's silicone mold, correct? Silicone. Yep. And did mold release sprayed in it? Nope. Just straight up. Uh, yeah, yeah, you don't really need it typically. Now, mold release will, um, it'll, it'll prolong the life of your mold. But I find like Alumilite Clear. That's one of the, another reason why I actually like using Alumilite. It's not very hard on your molds. It doesn't like stick to it and degrade them. Epoxies are pretty harsh on molds. All right, now we got our our, our gator jaw teeth thing, the holes. I'm gonna push push this in sideways because I want that resin to kind of fill it up. <clears throat> I want it to fill up the holes. Maybe went a little little bit too much resin on this one, but that's okay. Told you you're gonna make a mess. There's some of that orange. It was hiding in there. 
All right, so we got our, our mold ready to go. Uh, now, if you're using silicone molds and you're gonna pressurize it, and I'll talk about that in a second, you wanna put your silicone mold on something that is hard and flat. Otherwise, when you pressurize it, it's gonna conform to whatever shape is underneath it. <coughs> so you're gonna have banana, banana blanks, is what I like to call them. And it took me a while to figure out what the heck was going on. I'd pull these things out and they'd be like bent up. And I realized even though I use a pot that has a pretty flat bottom, it ain't flat, dead flat. And so it would conform to that curvature. So we're gonna put it in the pressure pot here. I use CA Technologies pressure pots and I can take them up to 80 PSI. I go to 70, I like to be on the safe side of things and 70 is more than enough for resin casting for this type of your resin casting. Add our air, wait till that thing, and I got my regular regulator set to, to 70 PSI. <clears throat> and it'll shut off when it's at 70, or stop filling, I should say, and you're good to go. Now, for Alumalite Clear, the product that I was using, because it's a slow, uh, or I mean, a fast setting resin in general, even though it's called slow set, it's a fast setting resin, I generally, consider anything that's you know longer than like 15 20 minutes that's a slow setting resin anything under 15 is a, is a fast setting resin <clears throat> and uh, your faster setting resins you're generally going to need to uh, pressurize uh, and what you're doing is there's air bubbles in there and if you don't pressurize it it's not going to have enough time for the air bubbles to rise out and get out of that blank so uh, and even if you're using a, a, a slow setting resin this is something that a lot of people get they don't realize. Uh, if I was using epoxy, I got some back there. If I'm doing color swirls, you still gotta wait till the end when it's thickening up. And so you don't have all that time for the air bubbles to, to, to come out. You know, you're pouring it in the mold, mixing it, doing things. Um, either way, I recommend just using pressure so you don't have air bubbles in your blanks. Uh, just be guaranteed of that. So it's collapsing your air bubbles to the point that they're microscopic and then once it solidifies, they're just effectively not there anymore. So you got bubble free blanks and uh, you can go and uh, have some fun with some turning. And life is good. Life is good. So, it's, yeah. uh, so I hope that was kind of fun. I got other things, like I said, I can kind of pop in and out on things. I got, sure. I can always ask something else later, but I think okay. I'd give someone else a, a shot. Maybe someone will come you know, later on and, and, and see, want to see some casting. Yeah, um, I think I'm going to let Mr. Kelly Ando talk here in a minute. Um, nice. But since we're on resin, I wanted to interject, make a shameless plug, and mm -hmm. let everybody know that Spirocraft now, as in the last two weeks, has become a uh, California Air uh, pressure pot and compressor uh, dealer, as well as best, vac uh, best value vax, uh, vacuum chambers and pumps. So we're carrying a complete line of vacuum pumps and vacuum chambers and the um, pressure pots from California Air. So I have indeed embraced resin casting. It's fun. Oh yeah. <laughs> it's addictive. <laughs> well, Zach, we appreciate that very much. Uh, yeah. Thank you for all that. And I think I'm gonna uh, let Mr. Caliendo talk to us about the latest Easy Wood tools. And then Mr. Roper, after he does his talk about the tools, you're going to be making, what are you going to be turning for us, Roper? Um, I got a spinning top here to warm up with, and then I got a small locust bowl. I figured I'd go over some tips and tricks on how to make wood turning a little easier for you. And Excellent. everybody just loves to watch chips fly. So. Okay, cool. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to make, uh, do what I can to make Chris's screen here pop to be the main screen. There is a 20 second. For Zach. Yeah, go, fire away. Zach, you were talking about, um, being able to see the tube through your blank. I've mm -hmm. actually had a couple of buddies out here that have been playing around a little bit of casting. They've started to paint their tubes. That yeah, way, that's... you don't see the brass. Have you tried it? Yeah, uh, you can either paint the tubes or paint the inside of the blank even. Um, oh, okay. I gotta be honest, I don't like messing with that if I don't have to. That's, that's why a lot of people just kind of want opaque. That's kind of why I just didn't even mention it. But yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, you paint the tubes. Actually, one another thing that, that you might be kind of interested in, maybe you can share with your buddy. Um, one thing that I do, because like I said, I'm a little bit on the lazy side, I would say. I, I'd rather not have to paint tubes. Um, a lot of times, if you paint the tube and it's a very transparent blank, it's going to completely alter the look of the blank. It's going to take on that color and look like you almost dyed the resin, basically, especially if you paint the inside of the, the blank itself. 
it's heavily going to become that color. So one thing that I do is I use these nickel plated tubes. Um, I think most people just don't, the brass tubes are just ugly. Like they just stick out like a sore thumb. Uh, whereas something that's just, it looks kind of chrome, you know, chrome plated, that actually can get you around some of the problems. Now, the only issue and, and the, the difference between painting a tube and painting the inside of the blank is going to be glue splotches. You, you know, if it's very transparent, um, you know, and I just stick one of those silver tubes on, you're probably going to see a few little glue blobs here and there. But for me, I'd rather, most people can't even see that. They don't notice. <laughs> you know, so I'd rather just go with that personally uh, than take the time to paint and do all this other stuff where it may alter the look of the blank. Cool. Yeah. All right. I'm going to try and get Mr. Chris to be on the uh, first screen here. There's a 20 second delay. So from when, when I change things to when I see it show up over on Facebook, but you're there, Chris, you're all, you're live. I'm here. There you go. Well, hey everybody. I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about the new, the newest tools from Easy Wood Tools. Uh, that Bradley represents, but before I do, I really want to say that, uh, you know, we're here celebrating the one year anniversary of Spyrocraft, and um, I want to congratulate Bradley, obviously. Uh, most of us have known Bradley for a lot longer than the last year, and we know Bradley as, as a, a teacher and an educator and a demonstrator and a few other adjectives I'm sure um, but with Spyrocraft he's really taken on a bigger role as uh, uh, more on the retail side and I may be one of the folks that have have had the advantage of working with him on that reset retail side uh, as, as, at least as much as anybody else in that we worked together at some of the weekend we're working shows earlier in, in the year and I got to see firsthand the uh, the efforts that he put forward into developing Spyrocraft and and really transitioning into the, the new role that Spyrocraft is taking on. And uh, I just want to say that I, I think he's done a stand-up job um, transitioning and, and learning on the fly. Uh, we did have an opportunity to work together in kind of a last-minute type of situation where things were thrown together and thrown at him pretty quickly, and he responded admirably. Uh, set up for the for the 13 week show season that we did at the beginning of the year, where he was a retailer for Easy Wood Tools as well as other products, and uh, I can tell you that, <clears throat> excuse me, I can tell you that we're very proud to have him as a retailer, and Spirecraft representing Easy Wood Tools, and uh, the other companies that he represents should feel exactly the same. Well, thank you, Chris. Um, it's been quite the adventure. That's that's the short version of all I can say about that. Quite the adventure. Um, and I wouldn't trade it for the world. Yep. Well, congratulations on the one year. Um, it's been a great year for, for uh, Easywood Tools. It's kind of hard to believe that it hasn't even been a year since we introduced our negative rate cutters. Um, I won't talk much about that because uh, it, has, it has been close to a year, not quite, but uh, they're very popular and, and uh, obviously very well known. Uh, what their purpose is and, and how well they work. Uh, we had the very lucky advantage of having Zach Higgins as one of our initial product testers with that product, uh, as well as a few others. Um, but uh, that product really took off and has really done a great job for us, as well as a lot of turners out there. Made a lot of turners, especially of resin materials, very, very happy. So that's been a very good success for us. Uh, much, much more recently, we've come out with a couple of new products. Uh, one, the first one has been on the market for almost two months now. We partnered with uh, a YouTuber and demonstrator of Easy Wood Tools, Carl Jacobson, on a new wire burning set. Uh, let's see if you can see this. I don't know you can see this on the screen here. It's very far away, so I can't really tell on my screen that I'm watching. But this is the uh, new wire burning set from Easy Wood Tools. It comes with the two maple handles. And the big difference in this set, as compared to others on the market uh, today, um, the wires 
on the other sets are permanently fastened to the handles. So when the wires wear out and, and end up breaking, you have to throw the whole set away and buy a set. Well, with our set, we've designed it so that there's a quick release feature with the wires. So when a wire wears and breaks, you never have to replace the handles, you just replace the wire. The wire set comes with the two maple handles, uh, the sure grip handles, and it comes with nine different wires, three different lengths and three different gauges of each length. So that's our new wire burning set. And just earlier this month, we introduced our mini hollowing set. This is a little bit bigger, so I'm going to back up a little bit. So you can see it all on the screen, and I'll take these out individually. So with Easy Wood Tools, we listen to our, our fans and people that are using our tools. Uh, we get a lot of feedback from people asking, asking for new product development, asking for different tools that we don't currently offer. And one of the things that we got a lot of feedback on was a smaller version of our current hollowing system. So we went out and uh, developed this new mini hollower. We went through a, a couple of design iterations. Uh, we landed with the, Toolbar size is basically the toolbar length from the micro tools that we developed a few years back. And we tested different lengths of handles, but because this is a hollower, we chose to go with the mini size handle. It's a little bit longer than the micro tool. It gives you a little bit better control, especially with the hook tools, um, because when the cutter is offset from the center line, it it'll, it'll tend to twist on you. So the longer handle will give you a little bit better control. And then what we also did with the new micro or mini followers is we paired that with the uh, negative rate cutters as a standard. That also smooths out the turn inside of a, of a blind opening, a blind hole. Uh, and when you're going in with the, with the hook tool, uh, minimizes the catches that you can get with a hollowing system and gives you a much smoother turn. So you can see the number one has a straight toolbar, the number two has a 45 degree angle, and the number three has a 90 degree angle. These are perfect for smaller projects, smaller boxes, uh, Christmas ornaments, and those types of projects. So this one's just been on the market for less than a month now, and it's uh, so far been very well received. That's, I mean, those things are fantastic. Yeah. I, I took them up to the other shop, and my dad and I uh, played with them. You know, just really nice. I think the negative rate cutter on these hollowers really makes a difference, especially when you're doing smaller projects like you're going to do with these with these tools. And with the cutter a little bit offset from center line, that, that negative rate cutter really makes the difference. And we're we're happy to be uh, giving a set of those away today as as one of our door prizes. That's correct. Some lucky turner out there is going to get a set of these. So, yep, they'll be very happy. They'll be very happy. Um, and of course, uh, I'm, I'm going to plug us again, Spirecraft. One thing that we do now, we include an extra wrench with every tool or cutter that somebody buys. Because I always lose the wrenches, as you well know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I have that same habit. <laughs> yeah, for everybody out there, Chris, I was I had lost all the wrenches out on the road this year, and he brought me an entire bag of the wrenches, and I lost the bag of wrenches. <laughs> <laughs> but I was able to find the bag again where I had safely put them. So, uh, right. but uh, so now I give one extra wrench away with every cutter or every tool that, that uh, is bought from Firecraft. And somebody asked the other day about could they get extra screws, and I said absolutely. So now I'll include extra screws as well. It's those little things, you know, that try and help people out. Yeah. Well, Chris, thank you. Um, absolutely. Bradley, I appreciate I, you invite, inviting me to be part of this event. Oh, absolutely. I was here a year ago. I'm sure you remember I was here a year ago. Of course. You guys, uh, when, you, when you first made the announcement and, and we went live and, and talked to people, uh, I'm honored to be back. Thank you, Don. Uh, Keep it up. I'm going to call Mr. Doug Dixon out publicly because I invited him today and I invited him last year and he won't show up and show his face. 
<laughs> so he's just shy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, thank you, Chris, very much uh, for talking about the tools and, and everything you had to say about Spirecraft. I really appreciate that. Mr. Roper, yes, I'm going to try and get you on the main screen here, buddy. How's it going, everyone? Let's see if I can make this work. If there's a delay and I have to click around sometimes. I'm a little technically challenged every once in a while. Now, I don't want me. I want you on the screen. Oh, there we go. Dallas, I don't want me. <laughs> I want you on the screen. You'll, you'll pop, there you are. You'll, you'll disappear for a second, Roper, and then you'll come back again. There we go. Uh, Even computers don't want me to be on the screen. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Roper, do you have any more volume by chance? I think that's about it. That's about it. Okay. Oh, uh, yeah. Roper, do you have any more volume by chance? Roper, do you have any more volume by chance? I think that's about it. That's about it. Okay. Yeah, sorry. I'm just doing this off of my phone. Okay. Did that work? Uh, a little bit. That'll, that'll work. You want me to get it a little closer? Uh, that's okay. Just yell. I can do that. I've been known to do that. <laughs> uh, go, yeah, go ahead and fire up there. Yeah, it looks like you're already set. Awesome. And um, sooner or later, I'll get you on the main screen there, I promise. Okay. Well, I want to say uh, happy anniversary to Spirecraft and Bradley. Um, it's been a crazy one year for you. I know that uh, having my own business, the first year is always the hardest. So congratulations for all your success. I know that you worked really hard on the woodworking show all spring long. So, um, yeah, it's been really good to watch your adventures in wood turning also. Well, thank you, Mr. So today, Roper. We're going to fire up a little spinning blank. We're going to do a little spinning top here real quick. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to get this guy around. Okay, I've got it between centers. I've got a two by two piece of maple here. It's about three and a half inches long. I'm going to spin this guy around. We're going to put a tenon on it real quick, get it into the four jaw chuck. We're going to go over some fun little uh, spiraling and texturing techniques and then do a little finishing. most critical parts of wood turning okay is making a good solid tenon before you put something into a four jaw chuck okay there's two parts that we need to know about the shoulder cut which needs to be flat up against the shoulder of the chuck jaws then we need to have the dovetail angle okay of the two of them i have found that the shoulder cut is much more critical than actually matching the dovetail angle we can compress those fibers a little bit to match that dovetail angle but that shoulder cut needs to be dead flat when we go to put this into the chuck all right flip this guy around hope everybody's having a wonderful day it is uh, a little afternoon here in colorado and the temperature in the shop is 88 degrees. So, this is a little bit of practice for SWAT, I think. <laughs> hey, it's all air conditioned in the hall, SWAT, buddy. I hear that you run from building to building there, so you don't spend much time outside. Uh, uh, yeah, last year, my lathe, my demo lathe didn't get delivered, and I had to run to Austin to pick one up from a woodcraft. And it was 103 when I left the hall. It was 106 when I got to Austin. Oh, oh, oh. They better have a lot of water down there for me and good beer. I say it's Texas. They got a lot of beer. All right. All right, so we've got a cylinder. We got it into the four-jaw chuck, okay? Now, 
This is going to be the spinning part of my top. I'm going to create a cone right here. Okay, we're going to do a little decoration, then I'm going to create the handle. cuts we get this nice sharp top right here okay now this was a cut through end grain I got a pretty nice cut on there but I want to make sure I got a really nice surface okay now Chris was already talking about his negative rake cutter from easy wood tool I love negative rake technology okay if you're ever having a problem with a cut that you can't get that surface quality you're looking for a negative rake cutter or scraper is going to be the best thing to get rid of some of those tool marks so here, I've got a small little scraper. I've reground it to a negative rake. I'm gonna make just a couple of passes across here. I'm gonna get rid of all of these tool marks that are on here. And that's it, a couple of passes. I cleaned up all of those tool marks. Now I'm good to give it a little bit of embellishment. We're gonna do a little bit of texturing work here on the end, and then we're gonna give it a couple of what I like to call speed lines. They don't really make the top go faster, but it makes it look a lot cooler. some texturing we got some speed lines going on there now we're gonna give it a quick sand now if you get a nice clean cut you really shouldn't need to start at a really aggressive grit I've got a little bit of 220 sandpaper here I'm just gonna do a little bit of quick hand sanding all I really want to do is knock down some of these fibers that didn't get severed while I was turning That's it. That's as much sanding as you should be doing on that. Okay? So now we're going to cut our handle real quick. Remember, these are all just bead and cove cuts. All I made was a cove cut here on the end. Now I'm going to make a few bead cuts to relieve some of this. And then the handle is going to be one gigantic cove. You guys got any questions for me? You're going to have to scream at Bradley because my screen isn't working right now.
Nothing? You guys got no questions for me? All right, I'm just going to keep turning. At least one of us is going to have fun. <laughs> some finishing we've got some fun products here first we're going to use a little bit of yorkshire grit okay we're going to put a little bit of this on to kind of enhance some of the sanding spots we've missed this is going to help to make it a little bit shinier after that then we're going to put some of this hampshire sheen on there sorry my table's not as close as everybody else's i got to keep walking out of the screen that's all right that's all right you got a can of vintage wax there buddy Oh, yeah. I mean, I've got still got some of the original stuff. Yeah. So you don't need a whole lot. A little bit goes a long way when you're using the Yorkshire grit. Okay. Now, remember, this isn't a finish. We don't need to apply a lot of it. Okay. This is an undercoat. I'm a big fan of applying this while the machine is off. If not, it goes everywhere except for on the piece that I want it to. Ask me how I know that. All right, we got it applied. Now we need to get it up to heat. We need to get up to speed because we need some heat and friction here to really work this in. All right, just like that. Now we're gonna put a little finish on it. Same thing, okay? I like to apply the wax with the machine off, then get it up to speed and really buff it in. Roper, Michael Lang wants to know what speed you're running at there. What speed am I running at here? I'm running at somewhere between Michael Roper and Jimmy Clue speed. <laughs> so 2000. No, I've got the lid going. 2,500 RPMs right now. So I was close, okay. But it's a little piece. Yeah. And I'm kind of comfortable at the lathe. So if you're not comfortable at running at that speed, you don't really need to turn these that fast. But it helps. But it does help. It helps to get a clean cut. And it really helps because the tools are designed to cut the wood at high speed. But you notice, Whenever they were cutting, we've always got that face shield on. Oh yeah, that's nice. Now we're gonna cut this off of here. There we go. One spinning top. Okay. Now, I love making spinning tops. Not because they're simple, even though they are. I love making spinning tops because they are a great warm up for when I get into the shop. Okay. These are all the cuts and techniques that you're going to use for any project that you're making. Okay. If you have had a rough evening, if you are getting into the shop and you don't feel your best, you make something small. See how everything's working. If this doesn't go right, don't be putting that monster 20-inch bowl blank on. 
So any other questions? You're gonna do a monster 20 inch bowl blank for us today? I could do a monster 20 inch, but we don't have that much time. I've got a small bowl blank if you guys wanna see it, but you guys gotta let me know. We'll, we'll let you know. We'll let you know. That's awesome. cool, Rupert. That Thanks is cool. Thank you, buddy. Uh, we appreciate it. Can, can you give me kind of a closer up of the, the top? Nice. Beautiful. Oh, I love the texture. That's awesome. Yeah, and it's real quick, and it's really fun. When nice. I see it at AEW, I'll show you how I do it, Zach. In the I'm time you made, AEW, unfortunately, in the time you made that top roper, I was able to pick all our winners for the prizes today. Wow. <laughs> and I was one of them. Oh no. <laughs> um. No. Oh, almost. <laughs> Okay, let me get myself on here. And um, the next thing I want to do is I do want to go ahead and announce the winners of, of our giveaway today. And then after I get done with this, I'm going to head out to my shop the studio out there and turn a little piece of resin. It's a little real small piece, and that will be my turning adventure for the day. Uh, but I want to go ahead and do this because I said I was going to do it about 2 o'clock, and it's about 2.10. So considering that I always run behind, I'm awful proud of myself at the moment for being within 10 minutes of having something uh, right on time. Oh, our first prize, grand prize, if you will, is a Rikon lathe. It's a Rikon 70-100, which is a 12, uh, 12 by 16 lathe. Uh, it is a single, it's got, I think six speeds, but it does not have an electronic variable speed, but it does have multiple speeds. And it's a nice little guy. I've got it set up in front of the lathe out there, if you look at the little picture, and you'll see it, and I'll show you when I get out there. And so the lucky winner today for the lathe, and I will ship this to you, I'll try to ship it to you, no charge, is William Dunlap. Uh, I don't know if, William, if you're with us here today or not. No, I haven't seen you over there on the screen. But if you are, congratulations. And if not, I will send you an email. Um, and you're the lucky winner of the lathe, the Rikon lathe. Now, on to our next one. Uh, the Easy Wood Tools new mini Halloween set that Chris uh, Caliendo was nice enough to show us all. That happens to go to a Chris Ware. Mr. Chris Ware is the lucky winner of a set of Easy Wood Halloween tools. And Chris, if you're not here, then you won't hear me, but I'll send you an email if you are here, congratulations. Uh, the next one, the next gift and prize we have is a Chromacraft. A Chromacraft set, I've got a quart of epoxy resin, a two part epoxy resin, three resin tint colors, uh, three pearlescent powders, and three uh, spin gems, kind of like an inlay or inlay. It's a polymer gem, polymer stone that you can put in, and it turns with the resin. There's a bunch of different colors, so that comes as I made up a little package, a little kit of that, and that goes out to I'm going to pronounce her name, Lorianne uh, Brush, and I'm pretty sure I know Lorianne. Um, I'm pretty sure, and I hope I pronounced your name correctly, Lorianne Brush. Uh, you get the Chromacraft resin and coloring kit today. And hopefully you hear this. If not, of course, you'll get the email. And then again, congratulations. Uh, Carter and Son 5 8 Bowl Gouge. Uh, tried to get uh, Valerie Carter from Carter and Son to come on today. It happens to be her birthday. So happy birthday, Valerie. She said that she and the family were going to be out celebrating this weekend. Uh, she uh, couldn't make it. But we do like uh, working with the Carter and Son tools. And so I have 5 8 bowl gouge today with a 16 inch handle. And that is going to go out to a Charles Reese. Charles Reese, congratulations for a Carter and Son 5 8 bowl gouge. You'll be really happy with that. Next, we have the Trend uh, Complete Halloween, or not Halloween, it's a complete sharpening system. I got all my tools mixed up in my head. Trend complete sharpening system. It is, let me bend down here real quick. 
So this happens to be right here. He says, uh, it's got a double sided credit card in it, 380 grit, uh, lapping fluid, cleaning block, instructional video. Uh, the trend products work really well. There you go, you guys can see it. Of course, it's in reverse, but uh, really good for sharpening your, your tools back up. And that goes out again to TJ McBain, McBlain. Uh, congratulations, TJ. The next item is a tin of Yorkshire grit. You just saw Roper using the Yorkshire grit. That stuff, that stuff works great. Uh, everybody loves it. I love it. I use it all the time. I use it on my wood. I use it on my resin. It works really, really well. That's going out to a Chris Geisen. Uh, Chris Geisen, congratulations on Yorkshire Drift. And our final little piece today is the Hampshire Sheen uh, High Gloss Wax. Uh, very good wax, microcrystalline wax. Use it after the Yorkshire Drift. And that goes out to Rich Bulduk. Bulduk. I believe that's correct. So Rich, congratulations on a tin of Hampshire Sheen High Gloss Wax. And that completes our giveaways today. Woo! Just in time for my voice to crack. <laughs> I don't know, like I said, if any of you guys are out here, I'm gonna look up here real quick. I don't see anybody there. Um, okay, I am going to mosey out to the studio. It'll take me a couple minutes to get out there and I'll switch over and you'll see me in the screen with the Spirocraft banner there and the lays on it. Um, if somebody else would like to have a conversation for a few minutes with the folks until I get out there and switch things over, I will be happy to turn it over to you. Who would like to talk? Any, anybody? I saw Chris raised his hand. I say, otherwise I'm going to put Chris on the spot. <laughs> Chris, uh, what I'm going to be using, if you want to talk about is I'm going to be using the micro tools. Very good. So I'll be using the set of micro tools with the negative rate cutters. So if you'd like to talk about those a little bit, um, I will show up out there in a couple of minutes and let me see if I can't get you on the screen. Awesome. As the main guy. That should, that should get you there. It's supposed to. I didn't read that chapter. Um, there I am. There you go. <laughs> All right. All right, well. Happy to see so many Chris's winning prizes today. Congratulations to everybody that won. Bradley's going out to his shop and he's going to be turning some of the resin that he has been casting. He's really gotten into uh, casting since the beginning of the year uh, with the Chromacraft products. Uh, I got to see some of that firsthand at the weekend shows that we worked together the first 13 weeks of the year. Uh, I obviously couldn't make it to all of those shows, but I made it to four or five of them and uh, uh, got to see some of the castings that, that Bradley was creating and uh, uh, also got the advantage of, of actually seeing him turning those, those creations. So that was a lot of fun for me as well. And I just love seeing people turn, especially with Easy Wood Tools, because I like to see their smiles. <laughs> <laughs> right, Zach? Yep. All right. So he's going to be turning a, I'm not sure what he's going to be making. Did he say it was going to be a bowl or a sphere or? I don't know. If I know Bradley. I think he's just going to wing it. Probably. <laughs> Probably. Probably just Probably going to right. be a mess. Well, I have, I, I am a believer and, and Roper, you may not agree with this, but I am a, I am a believer that uh, I step up to my lathe very often and the wood does speak to me. Now, I don't know if I can say the same thing about resin. <laughs> the resin speaks to you. You just, you know, sometimes you need a translator. <laughs> no. Actually, I think resin's easier, you know. You don't really have grain and all that kind of stuff. So, so you can go up to it and it's, it's all just about the shapes and, and, and bringing out that kind of color a little bit more. So it's yeah. kind of a little bit different than wood, I think. I would, I would agree though. Wood, wood tends to, to talk to you, especially, you know, you, usually it's just design on the fly because I screw something up and I'm like, oh, we're not going to do that anymore. We're going we're gonna to do it this way. <laughs> right. 
<laughs> and I can understand a little bit of the design on the fly, but what gets me the most is that there's no other form of woodworking in which you would start on a project without having a plan except for wood turning. Why is that? Like, it's the hardest thing as an instructor for me is to get guys to give me a drawing, show me what you are trying to make. It is so much easier for me to help you if I don't have to go into your brain and try to see what you want to make. Yeah, no, I agree with that. It's, it is kind of, I, I will say for me, it is kind of nice because, you know, like if you just want to, you're not going to just wing a, like a cabinet. Right, like it's just not going to work. No, uh, but you no. can wing, no, wing, you, you know, turning it. and stuff like that. Pen, like especially simple forms. But man, I'll tell you what, it is a lot better to have a definite plan. <laughs> yeah. You're just you're going to have better results, and you're going to be a lot happier with the end result if if you, you know, go into it intentionally rather than just ah, whatever. A lot of times it may be fun, but I mean, really, at that point, all you're doing is throwing chips on the floor. Yeah, and I agree with that. I, I mean, half of what it's about. And I'll usually you know, step up to my, is, I'll step up to my lathe, and I'll have some type of a plan in place. But uh, nine times out of ten, what comes off the lathe wasn't what I started with in my head, at least. <laughs> <laughs> well, and and I think that's that's the beauty of turning is, is Absolutely. you know you may not you may not nail it perfect but that, I, that is the thing that I, I guess going back to it again that's the thing if, if you screw up on a cabinet or something like that i mean in some cases you can be off a quarter inch it's done you, you screwed up and it's it's kind of over and you gotta you gotta really pull out the tools to to figure out how to fix that with turning oh i didn't hit the shape exactly that i wanted so i did something a little different and it looks beautiful you know and that and that's what we reach. That is the really... freedom of turning. You're right. Is that if something goes wrong, at least you can recover a piece. You know, I'm I furniture for a long time, and when you only get three out of four parts that aren't the right size, <laughs> you're in trouble. You know. Um, but at the same time, when I do a big production run, it's not like I can be winging those shapes. Like I have to yeah. be able to nail that shape. I mean, the last run was 55 uh, beer tap handles. You know, all done by hand, and that's not something that you can just eyeball. You know, you got to have a story stick. You got to be able to do a layout and things like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, 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 it's just, it's one of the things that, I don't know, I had one of the guys at AAW say something to me once, and he's like, isn't wood turning just the most uh, amazing hobby you could ever have? And I said, yeah, if it's your hobby. Yep. <laughs> You know, and that's right. Well, guys, and, you know, and hot. that's like, especially like production guys. You know, that's that's what separates the the fun weekend turners, which I, I definitely fall into that crowd. To somebody that's doing professional work, I mean, yeah, you're right. You can't you can't be just like, oh, I'll just wing this. Well, hopefully, the customer wants <laughs> wants whatever I come up with. <laughs> Do you like it? <laughs> yep. All right, I made it out to the studio. I'm so happy. I've been talking about this studio building for three years now, and it's still not done, but I'm close enough that I can get out here and work in it. Uh, this is where all of the uh, filming we're going to do for educational type uh, videos for Turnit is going to be. It's dedicated just to that. It, uh, it's not for turning. There's a whole other building next to me uh, for turning it to make a mess. This one is full of equipment and Above me is the light bars and the cameras that you can't quite see. Um, it's something I've been dreaming of for a long time to have just this little studio in here. So I am I'm beyond happy, is what I can say uh, about this. Here you can see the little uh, 7100 that um, uh, we gave away just a few minutes ago. And we'll get that boxed up and out. Now, out here, I've got a couple of cameras running. And right now, you're seeing the front. What I'm going to do. Um, I'll change cameras on you and you'll see how this works. There's a little bit of a delay because I'm running uh, a switch box. It's not in the software, it's in a switcher. And so you'll see a little bit of a change, a little flop in the uh, screen there when I change things. And that's the piece of the overhead shot. And this should be the side shot that you'll get of what we're turning here. And I'll go back to the overhead. This is the system I use out of the woodworking shows. It works great. 
What I've got here today is a little piece of Chromacraft epoxy. Uh, there we go. A piece of Chromacraft epoxy. And when I turn these pieces that are cast uh, out of the woodworking shows, I always cast a little bit long. I mix a little long on my resin. I'm going to change this camera to the front. There we go. I, I cast a little extra uh, resin. And I've got these little egg molds. Uh, you, as seen on TV, you make a hard-boiled egg without the shell. But they're not very good for that. But they work great for making little uh, excess castings. And so I use these out here on the road. And this has some of the Chromacraft uh, Tuscan Green Fin Gems in the top. And then some other colors. I see some green and some black in here. What I would do is I would have it in. The, I would invert the mold. And I would put in the, the uh, spin gems into the bottom of the mold, and I'd pour in some of the resin, and I'd make a slurry like I was making concrete. After that, I would pour in a color that was left over in the secondary cup, and then the third color to kind of make a base. So I really had a lot of fun with these. That's what I want to do today. I've got my easy chuck and my long daws on here, and I'm just going to hold this guy just right in the very tip of the jaws. But it still gets a good grip on it. And that's my reference for you be able to see the contract there. Make sure this guy's nice and snug. Now, Roper, you said it was 88 at your place. It's uh, it's probably about 92 out here with the air on and humid. You win. Yeah, I know. Uh, that's why I'm not going to be here long. So I'm going to be using the micro tools. One, two, and where did I put number three? Must have lost the tool when I was doing this earlier. That's scary. Probably in. Where did I put you? Well, I have a. I have a way around it. You lose the Allen wrench already? It's in my hand. <laughs> well, I didn't, this is the, I know what I did. I brought the wrong cutter for that one. Okay, never mind. I'll be using it. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> I do it for a living. Um, CI5 negative rate cutter and the CI7 negative rate cutter are on here. And I have a radius cutter on a mid size tool. For the radius square style negative break. That didn't bring the right cutter for the other one. So, this little egg is going to be interesting, and most of it I think I will probably run in the overhead for you because it's so small. So, I like to zoom you right in on that so you can see what's going on. And I'm coming at it from that side, so let me adjust this camera just a tick. Must have moved from all the heat. While I was in the office, or it might be easier just to play. Hey, Bradley. Yeah. Before you get going, yeah. I'm at the shop and I just had a client show up. So okay. I'm going to need to wrap this up so I can actually go take care of some real business. Well, Roper, we appreciate it. <laughs> but thank you very much for having me on here. Once again, happy anniversary. Thanks. Have fun. And I will see you guys in a couple of weeks in Raleigh at the AEW Symposium. Thank you very much, Mr. Roper. Take it easy, Roper. Thanks for having me. You guys really have a great forward to seeing you, Roper. Thanks a bunch. It was good hanging with you guys. Have a good one. Let's see what we can do. So I don't have a particular design in mind and how I like to make these guys. I will start out with the round style tool. Round style tool there. Gotta remember which camera I'm on. Make sure I'm at the center. And you'll see these gemstones start to um, show up. And when I get all done, I'll do a quick polish uh, with the Yorkshire grit on this guy. So I'm gonna put on my face shield and my dust mask. I'm gonna change back over here real quick. I have found, and from 
states. Sake of safety. Go back to uh, the dust masks. Even though with a microphone, I, I didn't use a dust mask on the road, and I have found, and you'll find out, that I can still use my dust mask and be safe. Not have to call and hack. So it does work. And turning the resin, you really do want to wear something. This stuff can be bad for you. And when I put my face shield on, you'll get some of the sound back. Make sure I have everything right there where I want it. Okay. And we should be good to go. All right. Back to the overhead. This is my pocket. Can we turn in uh, about 1100 RPMs that we're going to start at? Come on, I'll just get this round. Facebook comments, so I don't have access to any of that. If anybody has any questions, then any other guys see them, call around at me. switch cameras for you and I'm going to show you from the end. I'm going to go ahead and uh, hollow out this end in here a little bit. Let me go to number three. There we go. A little bit high on the tool there. Right in the center. Perfect. That's just a six Tool. If I don't really see it, and I come in here and I make release cuts. 
the very last one. And then the round that I don't have to work quite so hard. Okay? Then it'll take those away. We have a easier that one to cut. My cardboard can't get this way. So you can start to see the stone appearing. The more relief dust. Really 
And you can make this standard as thick as you want. You want to be careful with it. You can't get it hot, but it's really thin, and you can get it more. Flesh, it'll flesh on you, and you get a really small thin. Well, we got my my name is Terry Oliver. I'll take some more out with the tail tool, make it a little easier. Still coming through there, guys? Yes. Okay. Any kind of questions popping up at all that I need to answer? No, not that I see. Okay. I'm going to clean up the inside of this real quick again in the front. I'm not going to go through the arduous sanding process, but I will sand it real quick to dry sand paper. Um, just some quick, too funny kind of stuff. Take some of the bridges out. Normally, I would sand it through, and I like to use the triassic paper, but I don't have it. And that's a wet sand. It's a wet sand. I'm going to put the 3 triassic style paper. But we're just going to knock the chunks off of this real quick. Okay. 
like 120 and 220, just to give you the idea, so you can see the sound. You still see some tool marks in it, just because I'm doing this real quick. And I'm not going to worry about anything down here because I'm not done turning that yet. This is how I can make the, the cup and then make a really thin stem because I won't put any pressure on that stem because I'm already have been polished. Now if I was doing this right, I would I would have actually sanded this all the way through. Get my two grits out. I'll back over to the end for you. Uh, difference in Rover, I like to put it on without it spinning first. We all have our preferences. So I like to be sure to cover everything. And on the top view, you can see the difference now also. What was white, now you can see the stone. Stone powder started to show up. That's looking cool. I need a black background. Uh, but there you go. But if I just leave that out, I'm not sure which is better. I think the white was a little bit better. Okay, we'll go back with the white. Yeah. The bone is, is really neat. Yeah. And again, obviously. Sanded properly, but it has been you know, just quickly sanded just to kind of smooth it up a little bit. I'm really enjoying working with this particular product. It does look like a corian or a stone, uh, but it's resin, and you can control the ratio of material to resin. So this one is pretty dense in the top. Uh, I filled it full of the, the stone and then added the resin. But you can do less stone and more resin and you will get uh, clear spaces in between and get a whole different look. That's um, looking awesome. I like that stuff. Yeah, it's pretty cool. So now I'm hitting it with the microfine real quick. Again, imagine it's actually sanded. This is kind of the way I, I learned or taught myself to make goblets. Uh, when I first started turning, the first things I ever sold were for Aspen goblets. I make um, 10, 12 inches long, so I was in Colorado. That's the first thing I sold was goblets. I just kind of got a way that's comfortable for me. And this is how I go about it. And then I'm going to show you the inside before we continue on. I don't know if I can get it in there or not. So you can see how that's looking. That's awesome. Is the is the base a solid color? The base is a solid color, so it's a it's a multi pour. Okay. I had the resins mixed up uh, for the demonstration. I left a couple of cups of you know the, just the dregs of different colors, just enough to then they would they would um, pile up at the bottom off the sides and this resin has a long open time you've got about two or three hours to work with it yeah you can you can mess with it a lot and then the very bottom is black okay yeah that's cool so now we're gonna go ahead and keep going 
something. Small here, and this will turn white again, obviously. still there. I mean, to give you an idea, there's a CI-5. Yeah. Well, I'd have gone at least, I was going to go half that again if I was, I was hoping for a lucky day. <laughs> yeah. That's getting pretty thin. Well, he, well yeah, you know, I mean, that's what you got to do. <laughs> uh, if you see, I don't know if you've seen the video with it, uh, where I did the one in the flex. I wonder what? And it, it, it caught, it didn't, that didn't even catch, it just snapped. Um, have you seen the piece flex right in the stem? Oh. Well, that piece was pretty green, it was only a day old. So that might be the secret to uh, turning these really small or really thin. Because the stem is you know, brittle, as you know, when it gets hard and dry. Leave a little bit of flex in it. But anyway, it would have been cool. It's a good lesson. <laughs> I can assure you it's not the last one I'll break. And then there's what the base would have been uh, jet black. I'll look over to the overhead here again. The base would have been jet black. Yeah. With the stone in it. Let's see if we can't re put that guy back together. So it had potential. Yeah, that was a really cool piece. And just uh, recast it. Yeah, recast it. I can super glue it, but only because just to keep it together. Yeah. But it's a neat effect to have the stone color on the top and then transition over to a, a solid color on the bottom. Yeah, I like that. And it, you know, like it's all one piece, but it's not all one color. So it's kind of cool. Yeah. Well, what can I say? I you broke another one. <laughs> it's not the first time that he's broken one. Like I said, it won't be the last time that I've broken one. Um, it's all about having fun, enjoying yourself, and we're out here turning and all that. 
Um, guys, I'm going to run back in the house and jump on the office computers again, and we'll wrap this guy up. Any other questions, we'll take care of them there. So I'm going to jump back in the house, and I'll let Chris and Zach um, do that for just a second. I see they're still here, and I'll meet you in the house in a couple of minutes. Sounds good. Good deal. <laughs> It's getting pretty thin there. He's like about half the diameter of a CI5 cutter. I know. That's pretty thin stem. I know. I know. And he got it up about 3,000 RPM. Likes to tempt feet. <laughs> that thing was really cool, though. Yeah. I said, I've seen a lot of those little egg shapes that he does because, like he said, they're just kind of the overpour, you know, the extra material he's got left after he does his project and he pours those little eggs and actually got to turn a few of them myself at, at the shows and, and uh, they are a lot of fun. I mean, there's, there's so many different things with such a small little blank like that. No. Yeah, a lot of fun turning one. No, actually, well, just, just watching him do that, I, I honestly haven't really turned, I'm trying to think, I, I'm sure I've turned some sort of a goblet type sheep sometime, but honestly, it's been years and I probably did it out of wood when I first got started. So I haven't done anything with resin like that. I think I might have to be uh, making a blank and doing something like that. It looked really fun. Maybe not that small. <laughs> See, and that's, that's what it's all about. He inspired you to think about doing something different that you haven't done in quite a while or yeah. in resin. Well, and, and you know, the other thing that after I started using the negative rate cutters, and, and this is something that I always tell people, you know, I honestly just did not like hollowing anything for those yeah. cutters. Like I it just, it was, I would be tense. And what I found was I, I was turning a, just a bottle stopper and I, I fully intended to turn a bottle stopper and I got that number one. I'm just sitting there having fun on the end of it. And I'm like, oh, I wonder what, it'll, what this would look like, you know, kind of haul it out. So, I, you know, it's something that I, I want to do more of because I really enjoy hollowing now with the negative rate cutters. So that thing, I was, I was just watching that whole thing like, ooh, I, I got to make one of those. <laughs> now, well, long before you got the first set of negative rate cutters as one of our product testers, uh, I actually wore the hat as our, our test dummy. Uh, in the past, the stupid things that I could do with the tool, and it never gets to folks like you. Right. Uh, and I made a, a little miniature hollow form out of some, uh, I don't remember the name of the material now, but, but it's real brittle stuff. Polyester resin? Polyester urethane. Thank you. Yep. But, uh, the store managers here in Chicagoland made for me, the Woodcraft store managers made for me. Um, for that purpose to do some testing on a new product that we are developing. Mm -hmm. um, it was just amazing how easily it turned hollow forms. I hadn't done a whole lot of hollow forms or, or, or hollowing out like a smaller project. I've done a lot of bowls, but mm -hmm. a lot of goblets or smaller diameter hollowings. Um, right. I just took that material and just started doing a hollow form. Let's, let's see what happens. You know, I got my whole my gear on and all my safety gear like I always do. And uh, we're going to give it a try and hang on. And here we go. But it was amazing to me how, how easily it even that really nasty brittle stuff. I mean, it's not like alumalite. Alumalite's a joy to turn <laughs> yeah. polyester. You were turning polyester. Polyester urethane. Polyester. Urethane is what alumalite is. Okay, okay. No, it, it, it's kind of confusing. Zach, have you ever turned or messed with any vinyl ester? Uh, yeah, actually, I have. Well, not so much turned. I actually tried some out for. I was I was trying to find a good, like a super simple finish to put on pens and small things like that. I think it was like a UV kind of thing. That stuff's pretty hard, right? Now, when I was a boat builder, we used to build fiberglass kayaks out of vinyl ester. Yeah. It kind was more of, expensive than your, your regular polyester that we built with. Pretty tough stuff, isn't it? Yeah, real tough stuff. Okay. Um, and epoxy was, a, was the top of the line. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah I don't know. They all... 
all, they're all kind of similar, <laughs> you know, I mean, really. And for turning and stuff like that, uh, you know, unless they go way off the deep end with, like, hardness or brittle, generally they all kind of work similar, you know. Or you turn a little too fast and get a little too thin and well and you, and you, and you end up parting it off <laughs> <laughs> you can, it was amazing because all i did was just touch it just, yeah i know really engage the tool again you get that yeah well it is uh three o'clock i've been out here for two hours um, i think it's probably time to wrap this up i would like to thank zach you and chris for coming and all the attendees who have joined over in uh, facebook everybody who registered for today's uh, celebration of the first anniversary of spivercraft if you didn't win anything but you want to save some money up in there the, the codes or the uh registration is still up on the on all the posts on facebook and you can still register and you'll get the discount codes and make a purchase and save a bunch of money through midnight tonight so that will keep on going uh, i do appreciate everybody who's come out uh we, we can't grow without everybody that helps us out and we just keep right on going we really we really do appreciate it i mean that sincerely so with that i think we'll wind this up and take a break, relax, shut down the shop, and go watch a little NASCAR. Nice. <laughs> All right, everybody, thank you very much. I appreciate it. And we are going to turn this off. Y'all have a good day. If you have any questions, be sure to email me and be happy to get back to you. Thanks now. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.